Okay, so now we are open for our attendees to uh, slowly log in. Uh, I see we have a first person, two people. Okay, they're coming in. Um, and we will start in about a minute. People are still logging in, so uh, we'll give it uh, about 30 more seconds before we will start. Please stay tuned um, as we are waiting for our friends and colleagues to log into this discussion this morning. Okay, good morning here in California, good afternoon in Israel, and also uh, early morning to our friends in New York and the East Coast. Uh, my name is Sharon Vanek, I'm the Executive Director of the California Israel uh, Chamber of Commerce. For those who don't know, the California Israel Chamber of Commerce, known as the CICC, is a nonprofit organization, industry so supported which is dedicated to the promotion and strengthening the technology and trade relations between the business communities in California and those of, of Israel. Of Israel. Um, before we start today, I would like to let our audience know that the statements, analysis, opinions, and conclusions in this webinar presentations are those of the speakers only. The information contained in this webinar is not intended to constitute advice of any kind or the rendering of the services by the CICC team. Please notice that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the CICC YouTube channel as long as it is relevant. I would like to thank our moderator of, uh, for today's uh, discussion, Iran Tagore. Um, Iran is a CICC board member. He is a partner with Newport LLC, a unique national advisory firm, advising CEOs, board directors, and investment funds on issue, different issues related to growth, uh, special situations, and challenges, as well as the creation of path of moder modernizations events. Um, Iran was previously a managing director with a, uh, with a Wall Street investment bank, focusing on private and public fi financing and M&A. Uh, he was involved in various uh, investments, as well as working on some of the US largest bankruptcies. This is his expertise, such as Enron Corporation and the MS MCI WorldCom. I would also like to welcome our speakers this morning who were generous to join us and share some insights on the current investment strategies. Um, I think that I will let Iran introduce our speakers and take the lead on this conversation. Iran? Thank you, Sharon. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, Good morning, afternoon, and evening, as Sean said, because we are participants in different places. We are all going through very um, historic times, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions and dilemma, and uh, we thought that um, when putting together this webinar that we'll try to give uh, the audience a direct uh, access to the voice of uh, 
some real investors, very really prominent investors, primarily in the area of corporate VC. And we are delighted to have a very distinguished panel here. Um, I think that one of the most important thing about this panel is that not only the, the personas that are joining us, but also the organizations are very different organizations, different regions, different culture, a different DNA. So it will allow us actually to see, I hope, different perspectives as well. And I think this is what makes this webinar um, a very interesting one, hopefully. And so with that, let's jump in. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. I'll start with Amit Sridharan. Um, he's a director with Mahindra Partners Venture, the Indian conglomerate um, of Mahindra Group, focusing on venture efforts in the US, in San Francisco Bay Area and the US in general. And previously was with traditional VCs as well as corporate VC with Tata in the Tata Group in India, in asset under management for about $1 billion, uh, the various investment. Thank you very much, Amit, for joining. Maybe you can tell a bit more about um, your organization, what you're doing, for the benefit of the audience, and then we'll go thank for Thank you, Ren. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Ren. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, uh, so, we invest at uh, Mahindra uh, in sort of areas which are very, very diverse, being a conglomerate. Uh, so my responsibility is to look at early stage investments, uh, in specifically in the United States, around pieces which are four, uh, four different pieces. One is uh, around enterprise software, where as a service provider, we partner with startups to be able to take certain uh, new emerging solutions uh, to, co to corporations in the US. So I, that, that's a very clear vertical where we are looking at uh, new emerging enterprise software technologies, whether it's a hybrid, uh, you know, moving to the hybrid cloud or whether it's AI, IoT, and things, and, and things around where enterprises look to deploy new solutions now, and we act as a partner. Another clear vertical is the whole mobility space where we are a large automotive player and we are obviously looking at electrification and newer areas where technology is sort of changing um, uh, the movement. So, and that's a, that's a specific vertical. The third is agriculture. Where, you know, Mahindra is the largest uh, tractor manufacturer in the world. And as you know, ag, ag itself is digitizing. And we believe that we are investing. So we have portfolio companies where we are looking at AI imagery. We are looking at robotics automation um, and things around ag. And, and the fourth is renewable energy or the new energy space. That's the way uh, things are moving towards originally solar, but now distributed grid and connecting the whole EV and the grid together. So these are four fundamental verticals where we miss and we look at early stage uh, pieces. We have about eight portfolio companies. We also look at partnerships where we take those companies to some of the startups or use, uh, work with them closely in the markets that we're interested in. Um, so that, that's it from our background. What's a typical check that you would usually write, Amit? So, uh, so when we are early, we come in right, uh, roughly at the one to three million check. We are co-investors. We don't lead rounds. We want to be participating with other investors in the round. So we try to be able to work with other investors when there's a term sheet already there and we participate in the round together with them. So it's a one to three million check size, preferably Series A is where we sort of get in. Um, series B, again, we are comfortable uh, if the valuations are reasonable. And so that's where we participate. Okay, fantastic. Um, our next panelist is Anil Achuta. Um, he is with TDK, the Japanese multinational electronic um, company. Actually, relatively a new operation, right? Anil, from 2018, about $50 million under uh, management. Um, prior to, um, to joining TDK, Anil was with the arm of uh, L'Oreal in Boston, and he also held some other research position in as he has PhD in chemical engineering. And I would say that the interesting thing about Anil that he has reviewed over the past year about 360 companies. This is like no single day without a company, I guess, that you see. And, uh, and you only made only two investments in so far. And although I know that the gates will be open, and I will let you know, t talk about them briefly one is like in the um, electric vehicle takeoff and landing. Sounds very fascinating. And another one that you just released. Um, so I'd like to talk about your background and organization for the benefit of the audience. Thank you. 
Yeah, <clears throat> thanks everyone. Um, uh, these are historic times indeed, and uh, um, really appreciate you inviting me here. Um, TDK, uh, ben, TDK Corp, uh, as Iran mentioned, has been around for over 80 years, uh, but TDK Ventures is a very new outfit. We started um, July of last year, and uh, um, we are a small 50 million, five zero, 50 million dollar fund, and uh, we focus on four separate areas. Key areas, uh, one is in mobility, two is in industry 4.0, Three is in new energies and four is in health and wellness. And um, we look at companies across the globe. Uh, we are uh, somewhat stage agnostic and uh, our typical check sizes vary from 250,000 to two and a half million dollars. Uh, similar to Mahindra, we actually follow. We do not usually lead rounds and uh, our investments uh, are really in the space of new technologies that TDK doesn't have that are working in new markets that don't exist today. And with that background, uh, we uh, made an investment actually yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, came out on uh, the public um, in a magneto cardiography uh, space. Uh, it's basically a, a company that is developing um, um, new types of sensors that could uh, measure tiny electrical signals of the heart uh, by measuring the magnetic signals of the heart. And this is uh, useful uh, because uh, it is uh, used in uh, triaging chest pain patients who go into the ER. And it's really uh, turns out that over eight to 10 million people in the US turn up to the ER every year with chest pain and the stratification of these patients who should be sent home versus who should actually have a cardiac uh, catheter procedure is not a very straightforward problem. And, th and this problem is actually exacerbated today because of COVID-19, because people with chest pain patients are afraid to even go to the ER. So this company is uh, solving that problem. Uh, we hopefully we can uh, hop onto this company and be on the board, help them to commercialize across the globe and uh, help patients as well as help hospitals save their resources. Thank you. All right, thank you. And the last one is uh, Matt Garrett from uh, in, in Salesforce is the, um, been before with Battery and Primus Venture, but right now is a managing part of Salesforce Venture, which is pretty much operating worldwide in like a, a real a, a regular capital, a venture capital fund, etc. cetera. Um, just, some of the statistics for, for a MAT operation, um, and maybe it's changing, because I'm sure it's changing every day, but it's like 400 investments so far, 90 M&As, uh, 90 M&As, 90 IPOs, about 260 currently in the portfolio. If we need to mention a few is the one we're using, one Zoom, right, and, and Dropbox. Maybe we'd like to tell more about what is your focus as actually a company that, or an operation that is, is is resident of this area originally. Uh, thank, thanks so much for the intro. Uh, I, I think you, you said it all. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Um, so uh, Salesforce Ventures, strategic investment arm for Salesforce, we do operate globally. We have uh, investment professionals in London, Japan, Australia, and the US. Um, and we do invest very heavily uh, in Israel. We've um, closed, uh, we have you know, over 10, 10, 15 investments there. Um, and the focus really is around largely application software that mirrors where we operate. And so the types of things we invest in, there's, there's sort of um, two, two or three uh, investment themes and, and motions that we really follow. And that is we're investing a lot in um, our, alongside our core product, sales, service, marketing, um, and digital commerce and things like that. And often we're investing in things that will complement our products and often going one step closer to the customer. Um, so, uh, or often we're connecting a little bit further into the back office. We also do a lot of investing into industry verticals, um, healthcare, finance, um, and within finance, uh, uh, wealth management, commercial banking, and things like that. And then, um, and, and some of the themes that we've really been focused on are along digital transformation. So, 
we have been investing heavily in, in AI and machine learning. Um, and, and as Salesforce is, you know, continuously shifting to be just a, a system of record to a system engagement, to a system of intelligent intelligence, uh, there's now a big focus on all things data and in the data gravity. And that's really what's what you're seeing in the enterprise. So how do you connect all these disparate data sets? How do you um, connect workflows across different applications, across different data sets? And now that you have all that data, how do you secure it, make sure it's um, protected? Um, how do you find it? And um, things like that. And we're heavily investing in automation as well, uh, getting data in and out of uh, app, uh, enterprise application software pretty seamlessly and automatically. Um, so with that in, in mind, uh, typically we're a series A, series B investor. That's um, frequency of investment, um, kind of one to $10 million investments generally, um, typically not leading in those cases, but we do, uh, we do write um, much, much larger checks um, on follow on rounds. And then occasionally we will lead um, a, a very large um, investment. Um, we, we, we announced, um, the we led the 400 million dollar investment in snowflake um recently is a good example that's not our our, our our usual pace but we do that from time to time as well okay fantastic thank you very much and sure. uh, maybe we'll jump into the next section at least for the benefit of the of the audience would like to to explain a bit what is really corporate vc and maybe i'll turn it uh, in, in back to to you, Matt, in terms of what sets apart the CVC for the entrepreneur versus regular VCs and investors? Um, what's the advantages actually of working with, with a CVC versus a regular VC? That's it. Matt, that's a question okay. for you. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> so our, uh, our dog just escaped. <laughs> um, so we uh, so some of the, the biggest difference is really the access to the operators exas um, within Salesforce, the the access to our product teams, um, access to, to go to market. So for every investment that we make, we have an exec sponsor who's generally on the product side. We work uh, very closely with those teams and make sure that they are, you know, very well integrated with those with those products. And, and we work really closely with them, um, uh, you know, on, on go to market. So. I think that as uh, money um, becomes much more of a, of a commodity, um, you know, everyone's looking for uh, investors that can be very helpful. And I think the, that's also true if you're a, if you're a corporate investor, um, you certainly have to bring a lot more than money to the table. Um, and so we, we, we definitely focus on that. And often if we take um, board observer seats, we will bring in um, um, a GM or one of our most experienced operators to sort of take that position with us and really make sure that the companies are getting, you know, as much leverage as they can from us. And so I think, I think that's the key. And, and we give, we give every, and every investment we make, we give them access to if they have questions about best practices on go to market pricing, anything on how to operate and scale their business. We give, we give those companies access to all of the operators um, and executives with, with inside of Salesforce. Um, any other thing from your end to add on this, Anil or Amit, or it's about the same concept? I mean, uh, uh, from our point of view, uh, it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, I would say we call it the TDK goodness. Uh, we always try to, in fact, the, the, the key underlying um, reason of why we invest in many times um, is uh, really we can add value. Uh, what happens is many times we see really good technologies, really good companies, but we feel that we, we don't really bring a lot of value. For example, if we saw a really good software company and we would think that, oh, wow, the financial returns are going to be great in this company, um, sometimes we, we really just be honestly, we, we tell the entrepreneur, hey, we really can add value here. So uh, we're going to pass because of that. Um, so uh, for us, I think the fundamental underlying thesis is we have to be able to add value. As Matt said, capital is a commodity and being able to provide the access to branding channels, um, being able to provide them uh, operating expertise, uh, manufacturing, um, and even distribution um, and things like that. Uh, especially in today's world, uh, I think it's very um, apt uh, where the financial VCs really cannot bring all of these uh, to bear 
at scale. Fair enough. Um, maybe another question about approaching the CPCs. Um, Amit, at what phase do you think, the, at what phase typically you see companies start to approach you? And what is the phase you would think that they should, they should actually approach you as a CPC? So I, I think a few points that I think people can keep in mind. I, one is, um, you know, the sharpening and the validation of the use cases, uh, I think, pretty important. Uh, early on, startups are like fundamentally focusing on some specific use cases or specific technology development on a kind of product. I think having the sort of broader vision to utilize the CVC experience or the corporation's experience in that space, uh, whether it's the platform of Salesforce or whether it's being able to look at PDK's uh, uh, core skills and being able to understand whether uh, Mahindra or any of these companies can actually make a difference uh, to the startup early on is extremely important. Uh, obviously, money is important, uh, right? Um, but I think more than that, if you're able to validate your use case and validate why it sort of would fit in the thesis of the copper venture capital arm, it's, it's, it's a far more easier fit. That, that's one. Second, I would think that you should also, as a founder, look at the portfolio of some of the companies and see whether are there similar are, are there uh, similar portfolio companies that have previously invested in, or are, do, they, they, do they talk about pieces which are in line with what the founders are sort of you know, uh, hitting at? So I think that's another important point where you actually try to create a fit between the CVC's thinking and your own uh, specific investment. Uh, and third is also getting a very strong syndicate of investors around financial and uh, CVCs also helps the CVC to feel far more comfortable in sort of getting into the, into the, into the deal. Um, uh, with our discussions with the company. So having a term sheet is, is great. Having a financial VC in the previous round is great who can validate your assumptions. Um, and, and, and those are the kind of things uh, I would look for um, uh, when, when, when we are looking to connect with a, a particular startup. So, so basically, you know, you would like to see other investors. I mean, I'm trying for the benefit of audience to get from you. What is the point that you actually, in what would like to see in order to get seriously engaged in a discussion because there is always a dilemma here, you know, when to approach the, the CBC. Um, I'll give you an example. If, you, if they look at your portfolio and they see that there are companies in the similar space, there is a dilemma. Okay, are they going to look at us and get information for the benefit of the existing portfolio company? Or, you know, is there any chance they're going to actually co to compete with us because they have much more resources? So, how do you actually balance this dilemma and what is the point that you're actually interested in, in entering into a very serious discussion about real investment with the portfolio, with the prospective company? Matt? Yeah, I'm happy to t talk about that. Um, a, couple, a couple things for us. The, the point of engagement really comes down to when, when, do we, uh, when do we see either a lot of um, customers asking for some sort of an integration or if the company is bumping into Salesforce in our products and their, their customers are saying, you know, it'd be great to have a better, uh, better type of integration. Sometimes we do go out hunting um, as well for certain solutions and maybe um, we know from talking to our product teams that, that we need some sort of a solution set there and that will often drive some of our investment decisions and and we'll proactively go out. I think um, on that last part about uh, making sure that you know the companies feel feel comfortable and that you're not mining them for information. What I've what I've found is that transparency is the key thing. And so we will often meet with companies that could be competitive, might be competitive, or we think we're going to compete with them. And we're very upfront about what our product roadmaps are, how we think about the space, and. and we usually go really well. The, the companies are very um, appreciative of just the transparency and they understand what we're trying to do in the market. So even if we don't invest and we don't engage further, it's, it's very helpful. Um, and then even sometimes we will invest in companies knowing that there is um, overlap and there is conflict. Um, and when we'll just be very clear in terms of, hey, like when we're working together, um, this, is, this is how we're thinking about where you're strong and, and where we want to partner. Um, so let's just be very mindful when we're in, when we're in a joint account of how you're positioning ourselves. We'll do the same. Obviously, it's never perfect, and there's um, you know there there's uh, uh, some gray areas there. But I think it really comes down to being very direct, very honest, and, and very transparent with the companies. Does it sometimes affect the the deal structure? You know, um, 
not taking a board seat, taking only an observer, or actually not taking any observer or a board seat, and if, let's say limit more limited information rights. Do you see this happening sometimes? Um, not for that reason. And we take a very, let's say, uh, the approach we take to board observer seats is um, we don't have them in all cases. And in terms of who, who gets it and what the involvement is, we, we generally have a, a sort of a, of a mutual opt out and, and both, both sides have to agree and make sure that this is the right person and the right fit so that there's, so that they're getting a lot of value. And then, uh, yeah, if there, there have been situations where um, I, we did, we did have seen um, increasing conflict uh, with, with products and go to market. And in those cases we have, we have recu recused ourselves from being a board observer. Fair enough. Um, any other comments on that point from Anit or Ami? No, I mean, uh, I think, uh, the key here is intimacy with the management team. Um, one does not need a board observer seat or board seat in general to develop that intimacy with management team. So from a deal structuring point of view, we try to be very sort of entrepreneur friendly. Um, and uh, we try to be as vanilla as possible. Um, and the moment you start adding other layers in into contracts, um, it's usually complicated and, and you don't want to do that. Uh, we want to give entrepreneur, uh, we, we think about entrepreneur as our customer in many ways. Uh, in fact, we have a KPI within our system where we say, how likely is the entrepreneur willing to, um, uh, to, to recommend TDK Ventures to other entrepreneurs? So we're actually scored on that. Um, so we take that very seriously. And if uh, all the strange terms start creeping in, um, that's when we know that the entrepreneur will, will not score us very favorably. And uh, we want to try to keep that out and uh, really develop that intimacy with the management team. Um, and from a, um, yeah. Okay, Here excellent. I, I, I yeah, want to add one important point mm -hmm. here. I think, I think it's important to understand that corporate venture capital has a huge divergence, divergence. And there are questions that you raise that there are some corporations who have invest still in ventures and are looking for information rights and looking at us. I, I, I completely understand that founders need to be extremely uh, careful. And therefore, I, what I think the founders should do is also do diligence on the company. When I say that, it, I'm not saying it. So talk to other portfolio founders ask the CVC to give you references of other founders they've invested in. I mean, the track record of Salesforce speaks it all. It's got so many IPOs down the line. And, and those are kinds of things that, you know, founders should understand when they actually are looking at a corporate venture capital fund for investment. So obviously the money part is important. Uh, secondly, also the connect of the product with your own core, right? Is it a tangential product that is sort of useful for the company or is it going to be straight line in their line of business? Right. And if it is straight line in the line of business, then look at the cleaner the term sheet, the better it is, where you're trying to uh, sort of get those things going. Absolutely. We have Excellent. A question. We have a question from our audience. Um, you guys mentioned, at least for Mahindra and TDK, that you are looking at early stage uh, companies, but no one was talking here about big companies. So there is a question uh, from uh, one of our viewers, will a CVC invest in an early seed stage if the startup is relevant enough to the strategic direction of the corporate? Can anyone answer this? I can take it. Um, so uh, look, I think the, the um, seed stage comes in various flavors as, as uh, many of us know. Um, sometimes seed stage can mean just an idea on a napkin sketch. Sometimes seed could be mean um, early sales uh, of a maybe 500K or a million dollars. So um, if it's compelling enough, we will make seed investments. Um, Auto flight is a classic example. That's a seed investment. We don't, we, we, we don't lead rounds, but we made an exception to lead that round because it was so compelling of a company and so strategic um, that it did, um, we did make the seed round, but that doesn't mean that we, you know, we always make seed investments. We've seen over 700 and, uh, 700 odd companies totally as a fund in 10 months and we made one seed investment. So you, you understand the strike rate there. Yeah, thank you. Amit, will Mahindra um, partners will invest um, in a seed company? 
uh, again, I think very similar, and I can share both of Mahindra, and I think broadly the data also suggests that it is an, it's more of an exception rather than a norm uh, in, in corporate venture funding. And the, and the reason is that when you're looking at strategic connections, you're looking at a certain evolution of a company to be able to say that this is where their use case, this is where their real market opportunity lies. And that gets clearer as you move ahead in stages, right? And I think that's why follow-on checks are actually far bigger in some of the CVCs because as they see the conviction playing out in terms of their thesis on what this should actually do um, uh, as an industry disruptor, that sort of the checks size, size a week, CVCs could put on more money. So earlier is obviously seed stage or pre-seed, you've got more risk, more uh, volatility in the thinking. Obviously pivots happen even later, but I think the pivots are far fewer as you go and the risk is far lesser. So that's why I think it's, it's going to be, there are still companies where founders get very integrated with certain good CVC arms and they do make seed investments. But broadly, I think seed investments are less, lot lesser when it comes to CVCs. But it, it has been actually growing in the last three, four years uh, compared to before. But I, I think it's far lower number. Thank you, Amit. There is one Thank more you. question from the, from the audience. And I think I'll refer that to Matt since you have, I think, the most experience in this. Uh, one of our viewers is asking how many of the investments grown from investment to actual M&As. Uh, as, uh, as I think he wants to say, as a CBC, are you more looking to strive to M&A or having an unorganic growth? Um, yeah, so the, the M&A and, and creating a pipeline for M&A is, is by no means the primary goal of what we're doing. The, the goal of what we're doing is um, we think about it in terms of building an ecosystem of, of the best enterprise software companies and integrating them into our solution set. And, and we really wanna make sure that both sides benefit from this um, uh, mutually. And so that's, that's really the primary goal. Within that, we went over some of the um, numbers at the, at the um, onset in terms of the overall number of uh, M&A events that we've had. Um, you know, we've had dozens of those um, around 90 and um, we've, we've only acquired a handful of companies. And so that certainly happens and it'll certainly continue to happen. Um, but, but, but by no means is that the, the primary function. And so I think in order to operate as a, as a good CVC and operate for, for many number of years, you have, to, uh, you have to operate in a way such that you, you assume you're not, like, you're not the likely acquirer and, and uh, they're either gonna get bought by someone else or go public in that, in that you, you uh, need to help them along that journey as best as you can and create the most uh, um, value for, for everybody along the way. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to move to the next section, primarily tech, you know, after this uh, and getting a bit this understanding about how CDC works and talk about our current situation, COVID-19, what's the effect of COVID-19 on, on your activities. The, the market street consensus is pretty much that we are already in a recession. Um, put aside, you know, what's the definitions, um, I would say, what would be your definition when you talk about going back to normal um, or going back to the new normal? And what is the underlying assumption for you guys when you are looking at your operation? Um, I can say that, you know, many players, if you look at, you know, there was a survey by NFX saying that, you know, 40% of the um, investors, venture capital investors think that, you know, recovery will really come between April 21 to April in 2022. Seems like far away from now, but for you guys, you know, you're looking at seed investment center. What is really the horizon, time horizon um, that you have in mind right now when you're looking at new investment? And what's your corporation that have different DNA, I guess, how each company is during the current situation and its effect on your current activities. I'll start with you, Amit. So, so I think first at the, at the short term level, we have, we have certain committed capital, uh, which we will continue to deploy. Uh, but I, I think that, and uh, I haven't really uh, progressed on a specific uh, deal with a level of aggression in the last couple of months. Uh, uh, although we have a couple of deals in the pipeline, it's it's, uh, it's, it's been difficult to sort of move on some uh, some of the some of my own investment committee uh, meetings. 
right? So though there is committed capital, obviously other priorities are going to be slightly, uh, uh, you know, taking over at this time um, when, when we are responding. But uh, I think the, the core focus is for us to say, okay, how can we do, but do it in a much uh, smarter way. So one is obviously the opportunity to see um, uh, you know the right sort of deals, which which would, which would otherwise be difficult to, for us to get into. That that's something that we are seeing, uh, where conversations are uh, of uh, companies where earlier they were not much of interest uh, in aligning, um, because obviously valuations were higher, or they would be far more uh, interested in other uh, investors. Uh, sort of are looking at uh, newer investors also to participate. So. So that's, that's, that's definitely happening. Second is, I think we are also realigning and saying, what's our vision in terms of what we need to invest in terms of how the startups need to get to market, right? How quickly can the startups get to the kind of markets we want them to get into? So again, that's the second thing. And the third is looking at first certain themes like health tech and uh, new, which, which were already there, but we were looking at, looking at far more sharply in terms of how we can start building out uh, specific uh, themes and, specific companies around that. I think so, uh, so to, just to summarize, I think one is looking at more opportunities, uh, looking at uh, uh, things where valuations are reasonable. And the third is about really looking at newer areas, which we think would be accelerating post uh, uh, this situation. So have you, have you changed the rate of deploying capital in general, or this is not changed in that respect then? Yeah, I, I would say it is uh, slower in our case. Uh, okay. I don't think uh, I would be saying that it's uh, the same. So it is definitely uh, slower right now, but we don't know. So the, and, and I think the slowness is more temporary right now, more about the situation and uh, more about the lockdown rather than as, as a fundamental. Uh, so, so that's how I would think about it. But yes, uh, but we do have committed capital and which is not uh, something that's going to go away, but we are going sure. to be slower and more measured. Okay. What about Salesforce, Matt, in terms of, a, a, you know, any deals that you closed very recently, any closing that you see on the horizon, and does the rate of deploying capital has changed from your end? Sure. Um, so I'd say just in, in, um, in terms of our general investment strategy, I don't think there's um, any, any major shift. Um, certainly we'll see uh, you know, different sectors grow more aggressively coming out of this. Um, but you know, in terms, of, in terms of the adjustment to the rate of capital and where we're spending our time, we certainly um, um, you know, uh, Salesforce in, in general has been very um, up, out front of this and, and really focused on how can we help the existing portfolio companies kind of reacting, checking in, just trying to get a sense of what the new normal is and, and trying to see how we can, we can be of most help, whether that's um, capital or, or otherwise. Um, so along those lines, we've, we've um, been pretty active over the last few weeks. Um, we, you know, we just announced new investments. So we're still um, actively investing. Um, I think in terms of how that rate of capital deployment goes over the course of, of the year, um, I think that's largely going to be um, due to external factors. And that is you're seeing overall uh, deal volume. Um, and, and I think what you're seeing in the market is kind of a bifurcation of things. And that is um, we still see a pretty active early stage um, investment environment. The later stage investment environment, uh, what I mean by that is companies maybe at 5 million in recurring revenue and doubling or 10 million in recurring revenue and doubling. And, and uh, those, those investments, the pace there is really starting to slow down. And that's um, largely because, um, you know, it's kind of hard to, to figure out what, what the rest of this year is going to look like for those businesses and how do you think about valuing it. And there's generally a big lag between the, uh, the private markets and, and the public markets. And so um, to, for, for new investors to come in and pay a, a premium on the last round um, is harder. So what you're seeing happen right now is a lot of companies surrounding their, their good portfolio companies that are in the middle of a fundraise that may have a hard time raising um, an up round or a significant premium to the last round. Um, just working with the companies and saying, look, um, you know, we should think about, we need to have at least 18 to 24 months of capital. Um, how are we thinking about adjusting budgets and spends to get there? And then how much additional capital do we need to get there? Um, so a lot of these investments are, are largely being done by, by insiders with, with some exceptions. So, so basically you see more activities working with the um, existing portfolio companies 
um, we want to, to see increase in that, in that aspect um, to, to help them cross the storm pretty much as part, beside evaluating new deals. Um, so I think that's the initial, and, and that's kind of what, if you just think about what everyone's doing with their own business, um, and, and we could go on um, this in depth, but it's really just, you know, whoever your customers are, your core base of business, just checking in, how are you doing, is everyone healthy, um, just sort of these core basic things, um, and, and, and seeing how you can help deploying uh, additional capital is a piece of that, and so I think um, where, what we're seeing even in, in, in our businesses and other businesses um, is, is that's kind of, they were very internal focused um, in, in making sure that existing customers were, were okay and you know, there wasn't churn and things like that. You are starting to see in the last week or two that start to pivot and companies now thinking more about outbound prospecting, outbound selling. Um, and we're seeing that across our portfolio too. Um, and so, so I do think that you will see a, a reasonably steady state of, of early stage investments. Um, and, and I think it'll, I think it'll probably be a while before the later stage investment um, pace picks up. Okay, fair enough. Um, I would like to go and we jump back maybe. Um, Iran, well, yeah, I, yeah. I want to make one point here. I'm mm -hmm. sorry uh, to interrupt. I think, I think it's important to see, um, who's investing off balance sheet and who's investing from a, a fund. Um, uh, that's a question that entrepreneurs could ask. Um, and uh, if you're investing off balance sheet, I think you would be definitely affected. Um, uh, but if you have a fund separate and set out, then you know, your powder is available and you'll continue. So it might be one question that, that could help entrepreneurs. So that's why I wanted to chat in. I think it's a great point. Um, I agree. Um, I would like to move and discuss a bit of valuation um, because it might, might just relate to this a bit. You know, how do you really place value nowadays? When you look, you know, before when you have a public market that was very, I would say, rich, um, there was some benchmarking. Um, the benchmarking was relating to the previous round. You could see other comparables. You see that M&As are also richer. Generally speaking, if you look at what's happening right now and um, over the past months, besides the volatility, you could see that, you know, um, the, the, the peer ratio, for example, um, went down, but it went down because the price of the stock went down. But, you know, we don't have yet the new data after this, you know, stall in the economy. So it doesn't reflect much. Um, so the public market is not cannot be a very good benchmark or accurate benchmark. So how do you, how do you place value, or going to place value right now? Are you looking to see, um, you know, companies focusing on, on, on growth? You're going to see on the portfolio companies, for example, if they would like to do more stuff on more survival mode, how do you place the value? How do you play with it? Amit, you're smiling, Amit, so, you. So, I mean, there's no one answer to this, right? So mm -hmm. obviously you take multiples and other things, and. And, and there are various ways to do valuation, right? So you can obviously reduce your revenue multiple or if you have revenue, but if you are having other competitive benchmarks, uh, you can look at uh, lower multiples for any of those companies and say that. But I, so let's, let's look at really pre-revenue companies, people who are really uh, in the seed stage uh, are very, very early or trying to raise Series A. If they are pre-revenue, I think the best thing at this point in time is uh, to be able to uh, you use this as a note or uh, try to raise a bridge as a note and then wait for another three, four months or six months to be able to then get a better sense of where the valuations are going to rise. So that, that's one uh, thing that they could definitely do. Take, uh, take a, do, do a note as a bridge round and therefore you don't have to unlock valuation at this point in time uh, and then a sort of stretch it. Uh, but obviously that requires a lot of investors to come in uh, at that sort of uh, open-ended mindset where they get a discount at the time the valuation opens six months from now, or, or maybe a year from now. So do a bridge round is what I would uh, I would as, and do it do it as a note at this point in time and let a, a year down. Same as for companies which are trying to raise and probably many of them would probably get their existing investors to do uh, the bridge and and maybe again as a note to sort of you know stretch capital for them till the point in time where it, where they are very clear in terms of whether they need to do. Um, Again, internal investors can be, again, very useful at this time to even put a term sheet in. Uh, 
at what they think is again a fair valuation of a company with a minimal upside if the company needs to do a price round again um and uh, and there could be again opportunistic external investors who are interested in coming coming at this point in time where they see attractiveness in the valuation with very minimal step up so when when you are trying to create a step up from a last round i would think that you want to create um, a, a minimal step up which is probably agreed with the lead term sheet and and that would be for a certain lower your amount of capital that you want to raise with that step up so that you don't get too much dilution um with the kind of monies that you're trying to raise so i mean these are general generally i think that, that i i would recommend but there are obviously going to be other ways where uh, which is which are going to emerge well well definitely you know many players think that you know valuations are going down some statistics say that you know 40 43% this again an fx survey that 43% thinks that valuation will go by 30% um but but the, but but this is also a dilemma for the uh, for the founders i mean should we hold the effort of fundraising if we started should we hold if we do something like you suggest amit you know and we do um, a convertible note you know how much are we going to take uh, um, etc how big is the raise because of the, the if the dilution because of valuation is so lower um so what what do you suggest what would you suggest to founders right now would you suggest them basically you know adjust the valuation and get as much as you can as fast as you can or you tell them you know try to bridge the next year and then see what happens um um what would be your advice to them so, Neil? so, so and I, i love the other yeah. panelists also uh, talk about this because i think this is something that we're seeing even in our portfolio companies i think at one point they are definitely looking to cut costs Uh, when i say cut costs hire less stretch your capital uh, i think it this is not so it's got to be binary both the the uh, the the money that the, the cash flow has to be binary which is what is coming in and what what you're spending on has to be both reflective of it so what you're spending on is also you need something to keep tab on um, uh, and how many people you're hiring how many people you want uh, you know try there are various ways you can actually uh, sort of structure if you're really early uh you know you can get more people uh, to structure on a uh, more uh, higher uh, equity basis uh, you know rather than just pure cash basis so i think and if you are slightly later stage you'll have to then optimize your hiring um uh, at that point in time so building your base level of uh, cash flow spend or the burn is extremely uh, crucial at this point at the same time you also want to know how much runway you want to keep so if anybody is guess uh, whether you are satisfied with doing 6 months or 12 months of runway and what's going to be the environment uh, say 6 or 12 months from now so one can only hope that if you do 6 8 months of runway uh, maybe 21 and 2021 will be in a much better scenario uh, but it's again uh, it's a it's a call that you would need to uh, make obviously fundraising again and again is also hard i understand that for founders so but it's a decision that you need to make in terms of where you see your customers going where you see your revenue building up what the sort of burn you want to take where you want to get to i think this is a scenario planning exercise uh, we do that right now with all our portfolio companies and saying how can you stretch your cap until so at least end of december 21 that's what we are targeting with all our portfolio okay. companies so so i so yeah that so the time the time horizon for you is is december 21 some of the seed uh, the early stage company will say you know right now anyway if there is a recession we are still developing our product so actually if you look back to previous recessions if you continue with the pace and actually get get the product ready when the recession or when the market is turning then we are going to be ready will be just a time to slow down things actually we might caught up in a situation that everything is coming back to normal and our product is not ready so how you approach that and, and this is going to support actually raise the money spend the money and keep going how would you approach that um matt sorry can you can, I, i lost the yes. last part can yes. you see yes i'm saying how would how would you approach you know with your portfolio companies and in other prospects with the notion is that actually you need because we are developing product we develop technology we should actually not slow down not reduce the cost but just go go forward and finish it so yeah. when the the turning point in the economy then we'll be ready yeah that that's a good point and we actually uh, uh on another webinar I was on yesterday we went through a slide and um we we had this uh slide that showed basically hiring sales reps um similarly and it said if you're a company and you have 50 sales reps and you're going to 80 um and they showed the different hiring scenarios 
And, and what it, what it basically, what it basically showed that is if you, you know, if you slow down um, hiring the reps, you may save, you know, um, a, a million, million and a half dollars, $2 million, but your bookings would be, you know, the difference is like 35 to 45, like 10, there's a $10 million Delta in bookings. And that assumes that when things get better, you can start hiring and you can start ramping up. And so I would say generally, um, you know, be, be aggressive if you can, where you can. And, and what I mean by that is if you're a product centric company, like make sure you're developing the core features that you can, um, um, you know, not, not necessarily hiring a bunch of um, sales reps if you don't have the cash on hand, but, but definitely trying to, trying to not cut um, sales and marketing because it'll be very hard to get those people back um, after the, after the fact. And that was one of the takeaways that we had Salesforce had coming out of this is that, uh, we we kind of um, slowed down hiring, and, um, and and that hurt us on the way out. So we we are continuing to hire through this, um, particularly on the go to market side. Um, again, that's very company dependent. If you're you know if you only have a couple months of runway, um, and uh, and you're not sure how you're going to raise that next round, you have to take a very different set of actions. But we are um, we're we're kind of you know balancing the two and saying, look, you you need to have. 18 to 24 months of runway, assuming um, a, a scenario where bookings are dramatically down. We don't, we're not saying, you know, and we're modeling out these, these very, um, very conservative scenarios that we don't, we, we don't expect or hope aren't the actual scenarios, but we are planning for those and you need to have the cash to get through those within those constraints. Um, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't cut down to the bone. Um, and make sure, you know, you're still, you're still moving product forward and you're still, you still have some sales and marketing capability. Um, fair enough. Um, what I would like to do, because we have about 10 minutes left and we'd like to have some more time for q and I would like to um, um, move one, one step forward and, and get the sense from you about, you know, any shift, any shift in strategy, you know, um, because you know a lot is happening, and the the outcome will be of a bit a different world. For example, the future of work. You know, this is something that definitely we all see, as we see right now, is going to affect you know, a, a, you know, moving forward. Um, what any shift in your strategy right now? I mean, Matt already said that no, not much, but many maybe on your end, Anil and and Amit, any shift in strategy? What you're looking? What I would say. What are the trends that you have identified moving forward that are, you know, making it a bit more interesting for you at this point? What type of company will you you'll be focusing on? Um, and maybe what's the wish list that you have right now, given that you do have committed capital to deploy, you do want to deploy it, and uh, and maybe actually take advantage in many ways of the fact that you know there is some need for for additional capital in order to move forward. I'll start with you, Anil. Yeah, no, I mean, from a wish list standpoint, I, you know, it's as vanilla as it gets. Um, I want to invest in companies that have very strong backbone and are going to be very successful. And uh, hopefully we have, we find lots of synergies with TK, right? That's the sort of the underlying um, assumption um, in digital and energy transformation. That's, that's our thesis. We are very committed to that thesis and um, I, I only hope that we find more companies um, there. From a trend, emerging cool trends point of view, um, you know, recently I saw this um, article uh, where people in Northern India, uh, it was the first time in like 30 or 40 years, they saw the Himalayas again. Uh, you know, apparently it was all filled, filled with air pollution. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's some uh, sort of a gravitas to that, right? that we, we as humans are really polluting the world. And, and uh, I would love to see uh, um, many more companies that will make an impact on the global warming as well as be more green. Um, I think uh, we are paying a lot more attention to recycling. Um, yesterday we had a pitch um, on, on a, a technology uh, and the first question that came from our investment committee was, hey, can you recycle this? And we were like, oh, yeah, actually, we never thought about that. And, you know, questions like that are appearing. And um, I believe that we would want to see more companies that are being a lot more 
um, uh, sort of uh, mindful about uh, what we're doing to the planet and um, and be sustainable um, and 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 do good do good for the world as well as make profit. Okay, fair enough. It's a good point. Definitely, this area of ESG and you know corporate responsibility and sustainability is, has become a, a major point for many investors. It's a very flourishing in segment. Well, I mean, all of our investments is- have to have sustainability aspect. Uh, if you okay. five. We follow the uh, sustainability guidelines from uh, WHO and uh, yeah, uh, we, we have to invest in it. But uh, what I'm saying is we're going to probably double down on this. Fair enough. Great. Amit, what about Mahindra? So I think it's, it's going to be for us uh, be able to find sharper and more clearer um, sort of solutions where we are looking to invest. So just to bring you a broader perspective, like for example, in AgTech, we've been sort of uh, looking at a lot of startups which have been focusing a lot on solutions for different kinds of markets and different kinds of crops. Uh, but we're finding it hard to find startups to really be able to bring down the cost value equation to a point where there's scalability that sort of determines. And that's a design thinking issue right? as much as a startup uh, scale up issue, right? right? If you design products or automation which are very big and broad, they're never going to be, even if you're going to scale down costs, you're going to be able to bring it down to a certain level. So from a design thinking perspective, we want to look at solutions which can be scaled to market, not just to only big, large farms, but also smaller farms. So I think being able to sort of re-architect our own thinking and saying, hey, how quickly can startups get to market is again, a value for us and value for the startup. So I think that's the sort of direction we're moving into um, where we are saying that we don't want to just work with founders who have a vision for doing something 10 years out for the kind of markets we want to invest in, but more focusing on near-term markets that they could, they could enter. Matt, what about you? Um, you know, I think even looking at the here and now, I, I've been incredibly proud how so many of our portfolio companies have been really stepping up to help those in need and in, in, in helping um, try and solve the cur- current crisis we're in, whether it's um, portfolio companies stepping up and creating on the fly solutions that allow uh, hospitals and, and healthcare providers in, in Canada to monitor and track the health and safety of their employees um, and, and equipment so that they could very efficiently direct equipment from one another to other companies working with manufacturers and um, um, healthcare technology companies to spin up new designs for ventilators and um, it's been really, really inspiring. And I think it's also highlighting that, that we will see coming out of this. Um, we did a survey of our portfolio companies. 90, 90, 70% of them have found new areas of opportunity um, for business. 90% have um, believed that this is going to create a tailwind for enterprise software and SaaS solutions. And, and the reason for that is obviously we're witnessing this today. Zoom is a portfolio company. But um, even if you uh, even if you go beyond the um, you know telecommunication and the IT infrastructure such as VPN and things like that to enable remote work, um, we're seeing this other layer that that cloud solutions are providing, and that is not only are they necessary if you can't be in person um, to do these complex heavy installations, you need a cloud-based solution. But then you know there's this uh, secondary benefit that they have that's really becoming clear, which is you start to have innate collaboration capability that's that's built in um, to those solutions that that ties directly to the underlying data asset. And so um, as you see all of these industries getting disrupted and changing right now, whether it's manufacturers, as I mentioned, spinning up new designs or moving supply chains where it used to be very focused on one country predominantly, now you may have multiple countries. You're gonna have to spin these solutions up in a matter of days and in a matter of weeks um, versus a matter of, of months and years. And that requires cloud solutions, but that also requires um, remote collaboration um, and, and collaborating around like specific design concepts or specific supply chains. So I think you're going to see just a, a, a real acceleration of these technologies um, um, coming out of this. Quick question. Uh, I mean, a question with a quick answer from each one of you. We are all talking about technologies, um, and devices, solutions, and so on. Will any of you go out of your comfort zone and invest in something like wellness or biotech? Yes or no? 
Anil? We already invest in health and wellness, uh, so that's probably uh, uh, not the right question. So, um, okay. yeah. Sammy? Yeah, same here. So we have a specific healthcare focus. We have portfolio companies on healthcare. <laughs> I'm always looking not by. I'm not talking about devices, but maybe biotech, pharma, pure wellness. So pure wellness, yes, but not biotech specifically. That's not something that we would probably get. Into. Yeah, like a new new molecular entity or a bio, you know, like a vaccine or something like that. Um, no, we will not invest in that. Thank okay, you. Max. <laughs> Uh, if it's software, we will in new sectors, but uh, we don't want to go into those other areas where we don't think we offer um, unique uh, advantage or help. Okay. And another question, maybe the last question, then I'll get back to in each one of you with a closing statement. What is the decision process to invest? How long does it take? Uh, does it need a whole team approval? Um, quickly, one by one, because we are getting to the bottom of the hour. Uh, a minute left for this discussion. Yeah. Amit, what's the process yeah, in your so, end? Uh, our decision process, as I said, uh, we look at very close uh, use case sort of fitment uh, with the sort of pieces that I explained at the right of the start. Uh, and uh, our investment committee is quite flat in the sense that I actually take a proposal and if we think that there's a term sheet already on the table and we think uh, I have to make a decision on whether that's an investment, that's something that we want to present to the committee and the committee approves or disapproves it. So it's a pretty flat process. Like you can usually move an investment in a, um, I would say in a three or four week time frame is what I look at. But I think a large part of the work is about the diligence work that we need to do uh, more than the investment committee's uh, sort of uh, response to that. So it's a, it's a flat structure. I don't, so the decision is yes or no right after the investment committee. From our point of view, um, diligence takes about um, one to two months. Uh, decision making between four to eight days. That's the average. Thank you. Matt? Um, similar. We, we, we're pretty flat. We move very quickly. We can get to a, a yes, no in, in a matter of days or, or you know, uh, around a week. Um, but standard sort of, you know, diligence, full diligence process to close 30, 30 days-ish. Okay. Okay. Um, closing statement, gentlemen. Matt, one sentence. What can you say? Maybe a good advice to the, to the um, uh, listeners or anything else do you have in mind to close the session from your end? Um, the good advice, I would say, we'll get out of this. Um, we generally, you know, we've, we've seen these things before um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be um, difficult, but um, I think we can come out of this um, stronger and better. Thank you. Anil? Anil? Uh, focus on what you can do really well and focus on your core competencies and be positive and optimistic. Thank you. Amit? Uh, I, uh, so I would say that all founders should continue to stay hold forth. I think that there's an opportunity here because if we are starting out at this time, we're only going to see better fortunes ahead. So, and there's a lot of capital out there. So keep pitching. Don't uh, uh, don't think that there's no capital out there. There are there is enough surplus capital still out there that you should not lose hope and you should continue to focus on uh, your uh, like journey. Okay. Thank you so much. With all these positive closing statements that have to keep going. There is capital out there. We are still looking at investments. We're still looking at companies. I would like to thank each one of you today for joining us. Uh, thank you to our panel, panelists and speakers. Thank you to our audience around the world that is watching this. Um, I wish you all the best of luck. And if there is anything that we here at SPACC can help you with, uh, please uh, don't be shy and reach out to us. Uh, this uh, uh, webinar has been recorded and as I mentioned, uh, will be available on our uh, YouTube channel for others to watch. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay healthy, stay well, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank Bye. you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.